Hello everyone, this is Tom in Los Angeles. I hope you're having a great day or a great evening. Thanks for watching the video. I'm uh, going to talk today about uh, Canto 28 of Dante's Inferno with a bit of analysis and uh, comments as, uh, and a summary of the canto. Um, it's uh, to make it a little bit more digestible. I think you can, uh, we can divide the canto in three parts. The, first part uh, includes the introduction and uh, the meeting with Mohammed, the second part uh, the meeting with uh, Pierre and Mosca, and the third part uh, with uh, Bertrand de Born, um, which arguably, in Dante's intention, is the most important uh, meeting of this canto. It's a canto about war, uh, that's why there's such a terrifying massacre from the beginning to the end. Um, it's uh, very bloody, very gory, probably even more than what we've seen so far, with the intention of showing how bloody and gory a uh, battlefield is. That's, that's Dante's intention. But uh, the, the type of condemned souls who, who we're going to find here, which is the ninth pouch or the ninth bolgia, automale bolgia, is uh, uh, they are the schismatics or uh, the ones who, as Dante says, taught scandal and schism, uh, who divided uh, with their actions groups of people politically, historically, etc. And as a consequence of that, they are split themselves, literally chopped in pieces, and some limbs are missing. It's a, a bloody mess, literally. Um, another point, which is a, a general point of introduction for the canto, is that um, Dante, as always, takes a, a philosophical and theological approach to his themes, his thematics. And in this case, the reason why this pouch is so deep and so close to Lucifer in Inferno is that uh, even philosophically, the actions of these uh, characters and souls that he's going to meet have brought um, a disunity, they have brought a, a separation or a division in human society of any kind, even in micro societies like a family, for example. But uh, the, the thing they brought really is uh, evil in itself. Uh, Aristotle already, and then St. Thomas in his writings, had uh, repeatedly stated that uh, good is in unity that everything that is good tends to unify and harmonize, and everything that is bad and evil tends to separate and divide and split apart. That is the underlying philosophical theme that Dante is building upon. But then obviously there is the theme of uh, war, war in itself, war for politics, and that's why Bertrand de Born is a very crucial character in this, uh, in this canto, because he was a poet, he was a war poet, and uh, Dante, in, uh, in the way he used the language in this canto, he is uh, inspired, at least, by the style of poetry or of Bertrand de Boer. Language, like in this canto of Malibolge, tends to touch uh, really the lowest levels of uh, vulgarity, and to the point that some, some of the sentences were picked up by Machiavelli, another famous Toscan in Italian culture and literature, Machiavelli, who didn't like it. He didn't like the fact that Dante uh, had used all these uh, um, vulgar and trivial words in his Commedia. And so he called him, uh, I think he called him a pig and he, th he called him a pork just because he used this, this type of words. But really, if we think about the the overall in the original intent of Dante, even before starting the Divine Comedy, he, wa he wanted to write a, a medieval encyclopedia in Il Convivio, that was his big project, never finished. He then decided to write the comedy, but that type of uh, intent never disappeared from his mind. So in a certain sense, the, the, com the Commedia is also an, an encyclopedia. And as such, Dante wants the Commedia to contain everything, all the possible knowledge of his time, from the highest heights to the lowest lows of uh, language and behaviors and people. 
The concept that uh, division is bad in itself um, comes from Aristotle, but it's also found a lot of echoes throughout classical philosophy. In fact, uh, in Greek philosophy, it was repeated. Um, we found that the etymology itself of the word devil um, in Latin, in Italian is diavolo, comes from the Greek dia, diabolon, which means uh, to cut, to tear, to divide. And uh, of course, if the devil is the one par excellence who cuts and tear and divide, that tells us how serious this sin um, it was looked at from Dante and from his contemporaries. From uh, the third tercina, that starts with if all the Apulians who long ago mourned until the five, eight, seven, seventh or eighth tercina, Dante describes, uh, um, uses a long uh, complex simile. He describes uh, four battles, famous battles, two classic ones or historic ones, in fact, legendary as well, and two modern ones. To uh, get to the main sentence, which is um, at line 20 in my Pinsky translation, and he says, all this, uh, if, if we take all the dead people that fallen from these battles, it would be nothing to equal the mutilation I saw in that ninth chasm. That's the point of this long simile. The type of bloody gore that he's seeing uh, is not equated even by four huge battles put together. So all these battles are a perfect introduction for a martial canto, a canto that is very much about war and war poetry but also about uh, division. Dante's meeting with uh, Mohammed is terrible. It's terrible in many different senses. Uh, from our modern perspective, it is culturally unacceptable. And that's one reason why it's terrible, based on some uh, mistaken um, assumptions that Dante's contemporaries were, were making about uh, Islam and about the history of Mohammed. But it's also terrible because visually, uh, and with the language, Dante uh, is certainly not uh, flattering Muhammad at all. He says, No barrel staved in and missing its end piece ever gaped as wide as the man I saw split open from his chin down to the farting place. That's uh, in Italian, uh, dove si trulla, which is a vulgar term to uh, name this uh, farting place. And uh, that in itself uh, is, of course, a very negative connotation. If we also think that uh, out of all the similes that he could have used, Dante picked a barrel where typically you would put wine into. And uh, the relationship between Islam and the type of perception of wine and alcohol in Islam, that becomes even more offensive. And we look at the a more vulgar language, which Verbatim has been quoted by Machiavelli, as, as I was mentioning, where Dante says, Il tristo sacco, che merda fa di quel che si trangugia. A very crude way to describe uh, this interiora and uh, the intestines of Muhammad who is, who are, that are coming out of his uh, interior when he's showing this, this long cut through his chest. Now, there are at least two historical mistakes that Dante commits here at least, uh, that obviously modern historians have uh, clarified. The first one is the is this representation of uh, Mohammed as the body of Islam, and this is the reason why he's presented as cut through his body, while Ali uh, would be seen as the head of Islam. There was this uh, medieval conception that Ali was actually the, let's say, intellectual power behind the foundation of Islam, and Muhammad was the strong arm, the, the real warrior. We know that's not the case, that's completely mistaken, but that's how they, they thought back then in, in the 13th century and 14th century. The, the identity of Ali, that's Ali ibn, who was a cousin of Muhammad and a son-in-law. He died, uh, as soon as Muhammad died in 632, we know that there were some, uh, there was a split, and uh, Ali went on and founded what became the Shia 
Muslims. And uh, um, Abu Bakr was the one who went on to, let's say, channel what today uh, is the Sunni Muslim current within Islam. However, this type of division has very little, if not nothing, to do with what Dante is talking about here. Dante is referring to the mistaken perception of the Middle Ages, whereby Muhammad was not even, Muhammad was actually part of Christianity. He was a priest, allegedly, or even a cardinal, who for some reason, probably for apostasy, this was the mistaken legend, decided to create his own branch of Christianity and uh, bring with him a lot of Christians to found this new religion. And that's uh, the, the schism that Dante is referring to, historically inaccurate. Uh, just like uh, historically inaccurate is this relationship between Ali and uh, Mohammed, where Ali was the head and Mohammed was the body. And Mohammed goes on to explain the actual uh, definition of the sin of the souls in, in this Bolgia. He says, um, all you see here when alive talk scandal and schism. So they are clever like this. This uh, distinction between scandal and schism is something that uh, Dante accurately does in Italian as well. He calls them seminator di scandalo e di scisma. They were sowers of scandal and schism. Scandal uh, in uh, the Thomistic philosophy, in particular in St. Thomas, is a word that means stumbling block. So scandal refers to somebody who created a philosophical or theological stumbling block, that uh, something that act acted as a block to somebody that was searching for the truth and uh, was an obstacle for people to achieve the truth. It's fascinating to try and understand Dante's relationship with Islam and with Islamic culture. It's, uh, it was a very complex one because um, if we read this description of Muhammad, it's so negative and so offensive and inadmissible, as we, as we said. However, is this the only, let's say, attitude or approach that Dante had towards Islam? Absolutely not, because we already saw in, um, in Canto 4 that among the greatest thinkers, we saw Avicenna, Averroe, and even the Saladin. All of these um, inclusions in the comedy have a specific reason. In particular, the Islamic philosophers have been uh, seen as uh, uh, almost propodeutic to Aristotle, because Aristotle is so important to St. Thomas and to what from Dante's point of view, was his own modern Christianity. Uh, without Avicenna and uh, Averroes uh, commentaries and studies of Aristotle, in Dante's view, there wouldn't have been the ability to harmonize and to enrich Christianity through Aristotle, basically to do the work that St. Thomas did, St. Thomas Aquinas. And this is part of why he has a lot of admiration for Islamic culture. There is also another reason. We think that Brunetto Latini, one of Dante's main teachers, let's say, helped him, helped Dante discover and explore the Islamic literature and Islamic philosophy through some texts that he was able to bring with him from Spain, because Brunetto was traveling to Spain and back. In particular, um, a book called the, the Il Libro della Scala, in uh, Italian. I'm going to find the you know, how it's translated in English and, uh, and write it here on the video. But uh, that was a very important book because uh, it, was, uh, it was based not on the Quran, but based on some uh, um, of the commentaries of the Quran. And it tells of uh, Muhammad's journey to paradise and to hell with uh, different layers similar to the Divine Comedy. Uh, and with some imagery that specifically in specific cases uh, can be seen as having directly inspired the Dante's imagery in the Divine Comedy. We need to be balanced though because some people at the beginning of the 20th century when they rediscovered this text they said oh this is really the Divine Comedy comes from this it's uh, the same it's being copied 
it's really not. Uh, you need to you need to really stretch many of the images and similes to get from there to the Divine Comedy. However, some of them are are very similar. In fact, there is an example. For example, uh, the diviners in this book are represented as having their heads twisted and turn uh, with the face towards their back, which is exactly how Dante represents the hypocrites. So the approach, the cultural approach to Islam, overall, we can say from Dante's part, is fairly normal or normative for somebody of his times. Uh, fundamentally, Islam was seen as the enemy in Italy. Um, Islamic armies were um, trying to conquer southern Italy. There was, there were always some type of uh, battles and uh, issues from military point of view in the Mediterranean seas between uh, Italian armies and or Spanish ones and, uh, and, and and Muslim ones. It's always been a very contentious relationship, and this was reflected in the culture. Uh, however, there's a uh, uh, there's also a part of uh, acceptance and admiration uh, from Dante. So there is a constructive and productive conflict and contradiction. Uh, this is how we can define Dante's relationship with Islamic culture. Some parts of them uh, he rejected and some parts he really embraced and uh, admired. Here we have Mohammed's prophecy. Just like uh, later in the canto, we're going to have Pierre's prophecy. And Mohammed refers to Fra Dolcino, who was one uh, member of, uh, we can call it a sect, uh, called the Apostolici, the Apostolic Brethren, who were uh, a schismatic group in Italy, Christian, and uh, um, who were, had been preaching a return to natural Christianity, etc., etc. They, they, Dolcino in particular, uh, was preached a crusade against by the Pope in, in those times, and he was Pope Clement V. Dolcino had better store up grain against a winter siege, and the snow's duress or the Novarese will easily bring him down. So, Novarese is the bishop of Novara, who was uh, part of this crusade against Dolcino. They made a siege to his castle, and uh, at the end he had to surrender because they didn't have any food or water anymore. And he was uh, burned at the stake with, uh, I believe, his uh, woman. Uh, there is a, a legend that was also taken up by Umberto Eco in the name of the Rose, if you want to look into that. Immediately after, we see somebody else with uh, a broken face, the throat pierced through, the nose cut off, one ear remaining, some more gore in, uh, in this imagery. And this is Pierre de la Medicina, who we don't really know who this person was. We believe, and as it's understandable from the text, that Dante and Pierre used to know each other. He must have been a, a politician. And the schism that he is guilty of here was probably a political schism. In fact, uh, um, he was from a place near Bologna, and uh, it's terrible how he speaks uh, by opening wide his windpipe, basically. It's another terrible detail. Um, he launches into a long prophecy about uh, Guido and Angiolello. He tells Dante, tell Guido and Angiolello, these two guys are Guido del Cassero and Algiolello del Carignano. They were two leaders of Fano. Fano is a very nice and quaint town in uh, the region called Marche today, but back in those times, he was part of the uh, Romagna region, as called by Dante. These two were uh, warring with Malatestino, who was the Lord of Rimini. Uh, this Malatestino, terrible person, he said, okay, let's meet for a peace treaty, and uh, he, arrange things so that during their voyage to meet and or right after the voyage to meet for peace they were caught on the ship they were put into bags with stones and thrown out of uh, off board and drowned the betrayer who sees from one eye one eye only is Malatestino, lord of rimini so dante asks uh, what man do you mean who found the city bitter 
And this is an explanation that goes back to ancient Roman history. This person is Curio. Uh, Curio. Curio was uh, the man who, in Rimini, gave Caesar advice to march on Rome, to pass the Rubicon, the famous um, passage of the Rubicon, which was an event that really originated the entire civil war in Rome and therefore split uh, Rome with all the different, all the destruction and suffering that it created. And finally, we have Mosca de Lamberti uh, here on verse 95, one with both hands locked off. Both of his uh, hands are chopped off. His uh, uh, Mosca was actually mentioned by Chaco in uh, Canto VI, was one of these people that Dante would see in the blackest of, uh, in the darkest of dark places in, in hell. And here is where uh, he introduces himself. Mosca was a ghibellin and uh, um, is famous for <laughs> saying this uh, slogan, once done is done with, with in Italian is capua cosa fatta, cosa fatta capua. This is actually something that some people still say today in Italy, and the meaning is uh, cosa fatta capoa. Once you once you do this thing, it's done. It's almost like an encouragement to get something done, so that it's done. And you don't think about it anymore. So in uh, encouraging uh, murder, there was the origin of the rivalry between the family of the Donatis and the Anselmis, Guelphing, Guelphs and Ghibellines, respectively. This Mosca is seen as uh, one of the originators of this terrible civil war in Florence. So again, politics, again, civil war, and again, uh, splitting of society, splitting of uh, um, groups of people. And here we get to Bertrand de Bourg. It's, um, it's very, very interesting how Dante introduces this portion. I'm talking about uh, from verse uh, 103. I stay to see more one sight so incredible as I should fear to describe, except that conscience being pure in this encourages me to tell. There's something that the Pinsky translation is missing from the Italian, which is la buona compagnia che l'uomo francheggia sotto l'asbergo del sentirsi pura. He is, um, Dante is making a simile of himself being in good faith and therefore, like he has said before when he was describing something that was incredible, um, <clears throat> he's really in good, he's being in good faith and uh, his mission wanted by God, that in itself is proof that he's telling the truth. But in this case, there is a variation, and the variation is that he's using the word asbergo. Asbergo means uh, the armor, the armor of a knight, and that's what, in his simile, as a poet, Dante is wearing. He's wearing this uh, armor of purity, armor of good faith. Um, very interesting because he's really comparing himself to a warrior. In his own way, just like Bertrand de Born is a warrior and a war poet, Dante wants to see himself as a warrior for God and in his mission to write the Divine Comedy and in his mission to achieve the heights of paradise through the Divine Comedy, he's really fighting uh, almost a holy war. He's almost fighting a, a metaphorical crusade in, his, in, in this particular sense. As I said, Bertrand de Born was a poet. He was a French troubadour. Um, in terms of uh, why he is uh, split, because uh, we, we have this terrible image of uh, his body without head and him holding his head um, in fact, in Italian, he says he's weighing his head, which is nice because it gives you this slight movement of up and down, holding it for by the hair. He split because uh, he split a very powerful family. Uh, he was working at the English court and he supported or encouraged the plot of Prince Henry against his own father, King Henry II. Dante sees Bertrand as, uh, from a warrior point of view, as a rebel against authority for its own sake, as a warrior for, as a, somebody who loved war for its own sake. Uh, and so in his mind, Dante uh, compares this to something that in his times was a, a just war, 
there was a war for Christian reasons. He compares it to the situation to David and his son Absalom, where uh, King David's uh, advisor, um, Achitophel, encouraged Absalom to rebel against David. This is the, the comparison that he's making here. Um, from the poetry standpoint, Dante certainly admired Bertrand very much, and this is why the entire canto is full of these uh, martial images, is full of uh, Bertrand's uh, uh, language, style, and uh, is almost dedicated dedicated to him. It's a, it's a canto that really gives us uh, so much about local history and makes us reflect upon how much war, how many battles there were not only in Italy in those times, but uh, across Europe. We know that, right? We know that European history is a war after a war after a war, small ones, large ones, small ones, large ones. And uh, personally, I'm uh, surprised every time I try to look at it from a, a high level uh, that all throughout the Middle Ages and later uh, when then uh, you compare that for example with the history of uh, uh, China uh, which obviously has had uh, uh, military events and wars as well but uh, on a different scale and not uh, with such a insane frequency <laughs> as uh, in Europe. That would be an entire other chapter to, to open, another discussion to open, but I find it really, really interesting. So this is the end of uh, the 28th Canto, uh, probably the most gruesome of all uh, Inferno, and uh, it's best if nobody ever tries to do it into a movie or, or to make it into a movie because it would be really terrible to watch. But uh, it makes sense that after the more quiet Canto or on Guido, we are now back into really deeply infernal imagery and uh, we'll keep going now with Canto 29 the, the next time. Thanks very much for watching this video and uh, let me know what you thought about uh, Canto 28 in the comments. Speak soon.